Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second DC in the Movies webinar offered by Washington Walks, which is a DC-based walking tour company. Not giving any walking tours right now in this COVID time, but we knew we wanted to keep sharing our stories, DC content and history with you. And what better way on a Wednesday evening than to do that through taking a look at how Washington DC has been portrayed in the movies. Last week, we looked at Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, talked about that and how not only sites are portrayed, but how it evokes a lot about Washington DC. This week, in a very different vein, um, and at a different time, Mr. Smith's 1939. Tonight's film we're going to talk about, The Day the Earth Stood Still, comes in 1951, right after World War II and right during the beginnings of the Cold War. And we're going to talk tonight with Mike Canning, the critic, film critic for the Hillrag newspaper, author of the book Hollywood on the Potomac, and an avid movie reviewer, movie goer, but with a great niche expertise in how DC is portrayed in the movies. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Happy to be back, Carolyn. When's the last time, what, when's the first time actually that you encountered tonight's film? Do you remember? I do, actually. I remember most films I see, oddly enough. Um, lucky me. Yes, I was a, uh, a, a child of uh, uh, 11 in Fargo, North Dakota. Oh my God. Where I was born. Uh, and then later escaped to Washington, D.C. But it took a while. Uh, I saw it as a kid in a local cinema. Uh, it was in its first run, and it was a little late to Fargo uh, in 52. I saw it as part of a double feature in those days. And uh, I had a, I thought it was great. Uh, although some of my friends thought it was cheesy. Uh, it was different in those days because there was a bit of a splurge in um, outer space films in those days, which uh, nobody, unless they're my age, remembers. Uh, and it was the most serious, the most earnest. It was mm -hmm. a strange, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, silly and uh, blown me up and, and uh, unbelievable. That and another film called Destination Moon were the ones that most impressed me. It came out the same year. Um, and I have remembered it ever since. You know, you mentioned the suspense, but it wasn't, it wasn't facile. Right. I just looked at it again this afternoon and I was so struck by three things. One, how beautiful the black and white film itself is. Yes. Two, how still, how director Robert Wise is allows moments to happen and slow camera work, which plays into the slightly eerie, uncertain sense that you have in this movie. Also how Bernard Herrmann's score is like another character in the film. And well, the instruments also, that he uses are um, so effective. What you call is the pace, the slowness. I think the seriousness, which is also tense, also adds to what I think the filmmakers are trying to create, and that is a dignified setting for the character, the, the creature from outer space who comes and is should be taken seriously, and is. Yeah. Um, it may be that folks aren't as familiar with this movie as they might have been with Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Um, so we thought that it might be nice to look at the trailer, the original trailer for the film, to give people a sense of um, just the kind of look and feel of it. So I'm going to pull that up. And I promise last week, um, we tried to look at a film clip and I managed to do it wrong because I didn't do full screen. But I'm not gonna make that mistake this week. Sure. 
So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to make full screen. Here we go. We interrupt this program to give you a bulletin just received from one of our naval units at sea. A large object battling at supersonic speed is headed over the North Atlantic toward the east coast of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Drew Pearson. We bring you this special radio television broadcast in order to give you the very latest information on an amazing phenomenon. The arrival of a space ship in Washington. The Army has taken every precaution to meet any emergency which may develop. Just now. What could he do? There's no limit to what he could do. He could destroy the Earth. All vehicles, close in. Let's go. Wow. That shows a lot. I mean, it gives you a good, good sense. Um, that doesn't include um, a, uh, a big, big moment of Washington, D.C. Uh, we'll get to that. But what do people, what do you think people should know about this movie in terms of how Washington, D.C. is pro portrayed? Well, it's interesting that they use Washington as the subject matter, uh, which I think stems from the original uh, story that it comes from. Uh, but it makes sense because the, uh, the protagonist here, uh, Klaatu, wants to send a message to the world. In fact, he wants to talk to the president and then to the president, to world leaders everywhere, to tell them of, of this the threat from a constellation of other uh, planets that want to shake the earth up and make sure they uh, opt for peace instead of uh, violence. The context of 1950-51 is pure Cold War time. And the Russia having already developed a nuclear bomb along with us uh, is, a, is a period when the original writer and the, the writer of the uh, screenplay, North, wanted to highlight a, uh, a peace agenda or a peace promise for the world uh, and the frustration in their minds of a world, uh, potential world catastrophe between great, two great powers who were at odds. And this was peak probably in 1951, so it was a theme that everybody knew about. Um, I'll mention something else later about another theme that comes in, but the core of the, of the original story and of the filmmakers, the producers, and, uh, and uh, Robert Wise himself, was a story of how to address uh, a peace agenda that was exacerbated by the Cold War struggle. And um, would you say that the, that main character, um, we first see him coming off the spaceship with the round space helmet on, the Michael Rainey uh, character, Klaatu, is he a pacifist? Is that kind of who he's, the voice he is embodying? That's, I think that's what we would say uh, in that context. The, uh, the premise that he describes very briefly is that other planets way far away, as they say, 250 million miles, whatever that is, uh, have been observing, they're advanced, of course, they're farther advanced than we are. They've been observing us in the cosmos as a planet ready to blow itself up and threaten possibly other planets, so or other solar systems for that matter. So it's in their interest to basically come and advocate against our making a mess of the uh, cosmos. Whether those other planets are all peace loving and so on, I certainly we get the impression that they are from Plato. They've all figured out a way to live with each other. And the Earth is, a, is, a, uh, is gonna mess things up in the solar right. system unless something's done by it. So he's sent 
as the uh, Warner person who tells us to shape up. Presumably, then, the other planets and Klaatu himself would have been aware of Hiroshima. If the, you know, if the author is thinking about events that really had happened and the bombing of Nagasaki and just the sort of blitzkrieg of World War II. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's, it probably took them much, that much time, um, five or six years, to get there, uh, five, whatever interstellar years are. Oh, because it's 250 million miles away. Yeah, whatever. I mean, even if you're traveling close to the speed of light, that, that would be pretty tricky. But right. in any case, they've done it technically. We don't know how. And uh, it's a warning to us oblivious Earthlings uh, of what we could possibly do, namely destroy us and others. The first um, Earthlings... First yeah, he's not that peaceful in the sense that he's willing to destroy the planet if we don't shape up. Right. The first um, Americans or um, Earthlings that Klaatu encounters are members of the military. And we see that um, in the clip, they're amassing around the ellipse area where the spaceship has landed. But where he actually gets more deep engagement and uh, maybe gets more receptivity to his message is just in simple people, regular people living in a boarding house in Washington, DC, and in particular, a little boy. Right. Uh, and that's touching in a way because I mean, he really doesn't know Earth and he quizzes everybody. He wants to know what kind of a context he's in. He absorbs everything. Uh, but he finds that perhaps this Earth is savable, felt salvageable because the kid and his mom and other normal people that he does meet and he wants to meet them uh, are maybe they can accept reason. And that's why he has to see the greatest, greatest American, the greatest mind on Earth. The professor Barnhart, who is a professor, right? A professor, yeah, he's an astrophysicist, I guess. Right, he's a physicist, and uh, he wants to go to that guy right away and, with no fooling around, figure out what he needs to do to uh, turn the Earth around. And he wants, of course, to call together all the world leaders to tell them what they need to do. Right, and, and when he when he first mentions that to the powers that be, he they, it's impossible. We can't do that. But the professor has a different response. Different outlook, yes. Well, he, he is, well, at least the closest person to Klaatu's range of intelligence. And Klaatu isn't necessarily the greatest mind on his planet either. He's a messenger. He's a harbinger of what the, he wants the Earth to do. And, but uh, uh, the pref professor is so impressed right away that he's willing to do what he says. What is the, um, it's interesting that uh, the main female character in the film played by Patricia Neal is a widow, a war widow. And the two and her little boy go to Arlington Cemetery to visit the grave of her mm -hmm. husband. Is that significant that he, she's very sympathetic to him? Yes, as, as is his son. And that, that's a nice touch because the, um, his death, 1944, on the, on the tombstone, is, is like uh, Klaatu and company's last uh, straw. Here, here, here's a nice family and a nice kid, who they don't know that at the time, getting his father uh, destroyed in a war, in a war that I'm sure Klaatu doesn't think was ever necessary, right. and maybe wasn't. So uh, in that sense, this is the chance to, He's lucky, but he finds somebody who, in fact, is immediately sympathetic, especially the Neil character. Right. Just a, just a, a secretary on, in Washington, but she's right. reverberates for him in ways that other people would not. If he'd, if he'd landed in a farm place where a guy was a hard-ass uh, dairy farmer or something, he would have had a very different impression. Right. Or many, many other places I can think of. The uh, director of this film, Robert Wise, where does this film come in his career? Uh, mid, he, uh, he had a great career, more than 30 years, 35 years. He started as an as a, as a, uh, editor, a professional editor. He became one of the best in the business. In fact, he is, uh, if anything, more famous for editing Citizen Kane, which he did in 1940, than anything else he did, although he had other great successes too, like uh, the Sound of Music and uh, West Side Story. 
And he, his yeah. career lasted, you know, he lasted into the 70s, uh, 90s, really. I have um, part of my knowledge of this film comes from a, uh, a um, uh, documentary interview done about the film with Robert Wise in 1999. Wow. It's on my version of my DVD version, where, where which he tells very candidly and very conversationally about what he did with this film. But he had a, a good string of movies. He made a couple of good uh, film noirs. He, he was very flexible. Didn't make a lot of films, but many of them were telling. He's probably the most, I mean, the film that people know, the most popular film he probably made was The Sound of Music, I would say, right? No question. Yeah. He had but this film, this film is regu regularly listed as one of the most influential science fiction films ever made. And Correct. it's to have endured um, and, and maintained its status in that genre. Why do you think that is? What do you think was influential? Mm -hmm. I think because it was so different from other science fiction films, which is what I noticed when I was a kid. Um, and I was surprised that it had a, uh, I'm still surprised that it had a great life uh, after its original airing. It was launched at a period, as I indicated earlier, when science fiction films were hot and popular, but it wasn't like them, it was different. Uh, it actually cost a little more money. It was deemed a little more prestigious for its studio, uh, RKO, but it, um, or Fox, I'm sorry. And um, it, it lingered in a way that other 50s movies about science fiction didn't. They were, whatever they were, cheesier, more typical, more Hollywood. This is strictly Hollywood, nothing but, done by a bunch of professionals. But its tone was different and its lack of action relatively was different. Mm -hmm. Flavor, certainly it's music. The way it was shot, all of these things were different. And it had, a, it had a decent run when it came out, but it wasn't a blockbuster at all. It did okay, but it's had a great second life after I'd say the 70s and up to now. It's, its prestige has gained enormously, mm -hmm. um, in part because it was seen as so telling. And the fact that it's been reissued and uh, been the discussion in film books and other places so long uh, is surprising. The studio didn't know this was going to happen. In fact, movie makers never know it's going to happen to their movies. And, but this one's had a lingering, um, a little bit like Mr. Smith too, a long time perpetual replay, constantly mm -hmm. shown again and again, and deemed more serious and important now than then. Can I give it you a quick it, it, it has sort of a, a maybe a slightly kitsch moment in American film history. It would be the famous phrase that the that Klaatu tells Patricia Neal's character to utter if she needs to um, stop or control the robot Gort, which is Klaatu Barada Nico. But in the context of the film, that's not the only time the language of Klaatu is spoken. Near the beginning, he communicates with Gort the robot using yes. the language that the author of the original source created, right? Uh, well, it wasn't a language that it created, it was phrasing. Oh, phrasing, okay. Just a few things. <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of Klaatu, whatever the heck his planet was called. Uh, but, but that phrase too, by the way, became a catchphrase. Not mm -hmm. in 1951, but in the 60s or 70s. And it became, it was, it was in fact, it had been used in many movies, mostly for comic effect. Right. And usually with some kind of alien invasion. But right. uh, yeah, the, 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 it sounds like Michael Rennie, I, I, don't, I don't know this for sure, but when he first talks, communicates to uh, Gort from a distance uh, in, the, in the ship, it sounds like uh, Rennie's voice played backwards, saying something. Uh, I don't know what it is, if it's anything, maybe just garbled. So we're a ways from, um, let's say, J.R.R. Tolkien creating yes. the Elfish language, yes, which is ways. used in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy with no irony whatsoever, no. Um, really effectively. I would, so we, we're not quite there. We're not there yet with Klaatu's language. No. We have a phrase. No, no, no. All we've got is a phrase. And it, of course, according to the scriptwriter, it meant nothing. Right. 
I mean, how does um, how how does Washington D.C. come off in this film? How is Washington D.C. used in this film? Pretty well. This is one of the reasons I put it in my book because it pretty effectively shows Washington at the time. It's a fun film to see if you uh, both if you never sensed Washington in those in that epoch, and and if you lived through it. And I wasn't living in Washington at the time, but I've known Washington for most of my life since. And it gives a, a very uh, uh, convincing de depiction, realistic, even documentary style almost, of the city. Uh, a, a key thing here about the film that I, I mentioned uh, in a paragraph of my, uh, of my book on the film, and that is Washington's uh, local scenes, of which there are quite a few, was done not by the original director, but by what's called a second unit. Uh, this is often the case for what an assistant director does in a film. <clears throat> the director assigns a, another person to do location shooting somewhere else or shooting something else in another space just for efficiency. All of uh, this, everything serious about the day the earth still was shot in Hollywood in a, in a typical set of, uh, sets in Culver City, I think, California, outside LA. <clears throat> the second unit here, which took a while, I think maybe up to three weeks, was sent to Washington, a director, a lo a location person, production people, the whole schmear, was sent to Washington to get elements of the script that featured Washington physically. And so, for example, the dramatic, uh, which you're gonna show, the dramatic, arrival of the saucer in Washington was uh, shot with uh, sh a team shooting the monuments and then having a special effects saucer being put in them. But again and again, Washington is used to show uh, other elements of the plot. Uh, but almost all of the film, and they important- go, They go to Arlington. They do. Um, well, the, the unit does. The unit does. To, to highlight it first. And I love it that, um, well, I don't want to give anything away, but Klaatu needs um, medical attention at one point. Correct. And the, uh, it looks like it's a, a high ranking military official uh, officer comes up in a Jeep and he orders that Klaatu be brought to Walter Reed Army mm -hmm. Medical Hospital. Correct. Perfect. It's exactly. fascinating to me. That, That's right, but they got it right. Yeah, we, yeah. we got we to gotta, we gotta take him to Walter Reed. But I wondered why he wasn't being brought to a, a non-military hospital. But I suppose, I suppose in the context of the story, they want to be able to monitor him and maybe study him. Oh, oh sure, he's under surveillance all the time. Yeah. He's still suspected. He's, they, don't want, they want him under guard constantly. He might do something. Uh, but I, I forgot to highlight, none of, the actor, none of the actors, none appeared in Washington. None of them went to Washington, D.C. To, to be shot. They stayed in L.A. Uh, all the second unit did was do background stuff and set up some locations. So when you see that sequence, I guess we're gonna see it eventually. Wherever you see uh, standard monuments and so on, that's stuff they shot straight on, documentary style. Every time you see uh, Billy, Billy is his name, I think? Yeah, Billy, yep. Every time you see Billy and Klaatu, they are pasted in, or if, when you show that, it shows a close up like the, you don't to show a still of that nature. Um, so he, they were never there. They gave their lines against a backdrop that was projected behind them, typical special effect. You should show, let's look at the, uh, there's a photo, a still that you have um, that illustrates this really well. Let me find it a minute. There, here they are at the Lincoln Memorial together. Correct. Right. There they are at the Lincoln Memorial, and there they are not at the Lincoln Memorial, because the shot of the Lincoln Memorial was straight on and real, and Rennie and the kid, Gray, uh, Gary Gray, are, are in Hollywood being superimposed on the uh, memorial for that scene. Everywhere they're shown <clears throat> with lines, they are superimposed. Same thing at Arlington. If, however, they're shown at a distance, because there's a sequence just before this, when it shows them walking into the memorial, yes. uh, a high shot. That is a real shot of the memorial and real people, but they're standards. Right. I want to also look at this. Here's the poster. Yep. 
you advertise it. And to tell me, I thought there was a contrast between the movie that I watched this afternoon and the movie experience that's sort of being conveyed with this poster. What do you think? I'm sorry, repeat, I was a little up. Uh, oh, I think there's a difference between, I say the film I watched this afternoon didn't have quite the same feel. This looks more cheesy Much. than the actual film is. Absolutely. For instance, I don't remember any blonde, long haired blonde in a uh, pink gown with a plunging neckline. No. The film at all. I remember Patricia Neal as a um, intelligent, composed, um, very dedicated, like you said, professional, working mm -hmm. mom in Washington D.C. Right. No, this is a this is a travesty. But it's 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 not for uh, cognoscenti. It's not for people who who necessarily want to go see the film because it's of its humaneness. This is a poster uh, of the time. A big color, by the way, is color, not black and white. Right. Um, hello. Yeah. It's a I think we almost had King Kong's hand reaching in from from his from his movie into this movie and grasping the globe. Something went with. Okay, your sound went crazy. Oh, I'm sorry. I was say, it looks like uh, a King Kong hand. Reaching look at that big. Look at that big mitt sticking out. Yeah. And look at her pose. She's like Fay Ray. Yeah. In King yeah. Kong, which was uh, 19 years earlier. No, this is a Hollywood publicity section working on a poster that looked like all the alien invasion movies that had ever been made in Hollywood. Uh, and it's, 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 it's to draw attention. Um, the, uh, the actors don't even appear because they're not that famous. Um, Michael Rennie, by the way, was pretty unknown to Hollywood audiences altogether. Uh, Klaatu looks roughly the same, uh, but no, it's a, it's a kind of a mess, but you understand in context, this is what they had to portray the film as, because they wanted, uh, I don't know, 10-year-old boys to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's look at um, this wonderful footage of the flying saucer landing. This yeah. is going to be a particularly um, enjoyable segment for anyone who's a Washingtonian or familiar with Washingtonian, it's this is filmed in one of the most uh, well-known, well-traversed part of the city. Pay attention because as the flying saucer is descending across DC, the order in which the sights it might be seen, maybe it's not quite the order they really exist in. See if you can uh, pick that out. I'm going to find it a minute. Here we go. Reports are coming in from all over the empire, from all over the world. The government has not yet issued any statement, but there seems to be no question that there actually is a large unidentified object circling the earth at incredible speed. This is Elmer Davis again. We still don't know what it is or where it comes. Whoop. Sorry about that. Hope it comes up again. I know. Here we go. I see him. Video could not be decoded. Oh no, don't do this to us. Oh, this is so disappointing. <laughs> oh, no. Were you able to do a trial? I know. Um, let me see. Hmm. Well, let me see if I can just start it over. You know, I wondered if one of the things that adds some prestige to this film was the fact that um, all those broadcasters are um, real. Like real we saw of the time. in the trailer, that other uh, gentleman with the glasses. All right, let's try again. 
I'm going to advance that a little bit. Good. That's really well done. I mean, when it's just the spaceship is descending onto the ellipse, the shadow it is casting on yeah. the grass. It's really impressive. Special effects. Okay, you're going to ask people about what they're. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, so the spaceship travels along the National Mall. We established that with the Capitol. And then as it's going along, as a walking tour guide, I have always been thrilled in this film that very usually underrepresented buildings in DC are in that shot. Um, for instance, the Arts and Industries Building, which is next door to the Smithsonian Castle, a big, beautiful, high Victorian era building. Um, the Smithsonian Castle itself, the Department of Agriculture headquarters, which never gets in films. And then it looks to me also that this would be across, all those buildings I just mentioned are on the same south side of the National Mall. But across the way from them is uh, the front of the Natural History Museum. The Grant Memorial, which is at the base of the Capitol campus on the west side, is depicted in there. Of course, the Washington Monument. It's, it's great. But? But they're shown in the wrong order. Just one. OK, what's the one? When they, they go over the um, uh, arts and industries first, and then they go uh, over agriculture, you're right, rarely depicted. Most people couldn't, wouldn't identify it. And then they go back to the castle. Right. <laughs> which is uh, what east. And then they, but then they're consistent because they go back to the monument and circle. People run away from the ellipse, which is perfectly right. And then they, they land and, and that's, per, so that's the sequence is fine, except for that one little goof, because they wanted to get the silhouette of the uh, Smithsonian in there. I think what's so effective about that is in another, another filmmaker, and probably another composer would have that be so broadcast. This is dramatic. This is scary. And the music is going to do all that work for us. They go almost the opposite direction, that it's very restrained music in the background, mm -hmm. pulsating music. And it's left to us as the audience to just watch the expressions of the citizens as they recognize this thing in the sky. I would second the motion. The theremin is, um, in this case, subtle. It's not bombastic. Right. The theremin is that, that instrument that, um, one of the instruments that Bernard Herrmann uses to great effect in this soundtrack. I agree. Um, you mentioned that the actor who plays Klaatu, Michael Rainey, not at all known in America at the time, but that's a deliberate choice, right? I've right. read that Claude Rains and Spencer Tracy were considered for the part of Klaatu, but then in the end, the decision was, we should have someone who's unknown because it'll be more believable. People will accept that this is someone from another world. Yes, uh, it, it clearly worked. Uh, this is a popular film after all. Michael Rennie was an English actor who had a long career uh, and it had and started young. I mean, he had his acting work started in the 30s when he was an extra, and he he was uh, a second lead in many English films, uh, including some popular ones. Uh, but he'd never made a Hollywood film before 1951, and so this was um, his introduction basically to the American audience. Uh, so he was a he was a professional actor, stage actor too, uh, and this. Uh, identified him with not only with that role for the rest of his life, but he became a Hollywood fixture. He basically switched his life to Hollywood and made uh, dozens of Hollywood movies after that. He died in 1971. But this is, this is for, for his work in America, this will be what he was most remembered for? Oh, sure. Still is. If anybody remembers who he is, this is the film they'll remember. Well, I think for Patricia Neal, um, who we saw briefly in the trailer, this is early in her career, isn't it? 
Yes. Uh, she's, HUD. She, this is, what else is she big in? HUD, and I'm blanking on the other one, where she makes those two movies near, near each other. But this is, she's really young. Yes. I, I, she had, her career really was launched in the 50s. Uh, she was already established, uh, but she wasn't a big star. Uh, she was the star here. And she, by the way, she made another Washington movie at this time, which was uh, a, a well shot in Washington, but very obscure, called Washington Story. She was the lead with Van Johnson in a, a movie about uh, a congressman and his attempt to um, balance legislation for his home district as well as for the nation. It's a kind of a cheesy congressional picture, but it's very congressional. And it's extremely rare in that it has a, a lead and a hero, not a bum, who uh, gets the girl and does a good job instead of being a swine. <laughs> Very rare. And I think for that reason, it did no business and is totally unknown, but never mind. Uh, she had a, a decent career. She, she made a, a big hit with, um, oh, I'm blanking on a. Oh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. She's in that one. That's right. That's early 60s. Yep. And I'm thinking of another one with uh, Andy Griffith as a swinish. Uh, I know, right. I'm blanking uh -huh. on I'm I know on. exactly what you're talking about. I yeah, can't Ely Kazan. Never mind. Somebody yeah. in your group over Yeah, Ely Kazan. But that's another fine film. She does a great job with Walter Matthews. A Matt. Face in the Crowd. Michelle Barron was listening. Bingo. Face, Face in the Crowd is exactly yep. right. Yep. Um, that came from one of your uh, chatters. Great. Thank you. Yes. I have these memory lapses. I'm sorry. Don't blame me. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, ran, she did uh, even, she had a terrible uh, disease and, uh, and uh, it was out of movies for a while. Yeah, she a had a divorce. stroke. And then she came, yeah, and then she came back with, um, um, the subject was roses. Right. And worked, worked up into the, this century. She well, died while, we're, and while we're at it, um, she, I mean, just as an aside, I guess, maybe people don't know, she was married to British author Roald Dahl for right. a couple decades <clears throat> and lived in England for a while. And then they ended up getting a divorce and she comes back to the United States. And then I think what's really interesting too is at the end of her life, um, she has a conversion experience and becomes very dedicated um, Catholic shortly right. before her death. And when she died, she's buried in a, um, like a convent cemetery in Massachusetts. Correct. It's really something. a good run. She was a fine actress. Yeah. Well, you know what we got to talk about is right. that this is an example of a film we're looking at in this series that has had a remake. Yes. So what do you, what do you <laughs> tell us about that a little bit? Oh, just a little bit, because it's not worth renting, believe me. Uh, well, okay, maybe. If you like Keanu Reeves, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing it had going, uh, it was bombed when it came out, and I would, I would bomb it, too, for the same, most of the same reasons. Did you it, review it when it came out? I did not. I didn't think it was worth my time. And um, the switch here is considerable. The vague, the, the run of the story is similar. The cause, however, is not uh, nuclear uh, holocaust but environmental uh, degradation and desecration. The lead, uh, Plato, is played by uh, Keanu Reeves as a relatively young man, nowhere near the maturity of Rennie. And the one good thing about the movie is kind of uh, ironic. It's because Keanu Reeves is so robotic as an actor that he's <laughs> perfect for the role uh, of, a, of a guy who, and by the way, he doesn't look, and he doesn't have funny uh, costuming and stuff. It's just Keanu Reeves staring. Uh, and delivering his lines in a monotone. So it, it could be seen as pretty funny if you want to see it that way. Uh, but it's not very interesting. It takes place in Virginia in part, but mainly New York uh, and somewhere else, Pennsylvania, I believe. It doesn't have any DC reference whatsoever. Closest it gets is Virginia. Um, and uh, it ends similarly in that he f fades off and promising not to destroy the earth if they pay attention. Um, the, little, the little kid, he befriends is played by um, Will Smith's uh, son. Is it oh, Aiden? really? Jaden, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. Yep. But the but no, it's a it's kind of a mess. It has much different special effects, much more spectacular, much more costly, uh, but not no more effective than any other special effects movie and CGI movie. 
uh, it's kind of a waste. It was a little bit a, a bad idea to, to redo it, seems to me, or if they did, they should have done it in a very different context. Does that version also include an eight foot robot called Gort? Yes, it does. The um, much more uh, special effects than human. People laugh at Gort now because it's a, it's, they see it as a bad special effect. It was the best they could do and actually not bad. Uh, Listen, I kind of looked at it this afternoon and I thought, um, I mean, well, there's no Darth Vader without no. Gort. Mm -hmm. And uh, Darth Vader's character of um, really using, of course, physical stature and height, but stillness, mm -hmm. and through stillness, not a lot of, I mean, Gort doesn't talk at all, but, but very um, given to few words, and that also is a source of power. Um, I don't know, I didn't find Gort too cheesy this time around. I mean, you know, the beam coming from his helmet, like you say, that, <coughs> excuse me, is what they could do then. But an effect in the Gort costume that I thought was really effective was how his visor just goes. Yeah, but so effective. That was yeah, eerie. Distinctive. <coughs> yep. a, little, a, a word about uh, Gort, which is cute, uh, a trivia fact. Gort was a guy named Locke Martin. And that's a nickname, Locke. And he wasn't an actor at all. He was the uh, doorman at the Grumman's Chinese Theater in LA. And he was about seven foot seven, which is what <laughs> they hired him and put him in a suit. Uh, and he played uh, Gort. Uh, beautifully, not saying anything. Uh, and an odd thing about him personally was as big as he was, he was very frail, like many big people are. They're the subject of a, of a malady. And in fact, one of the, the clip of the um, intro clip you showed, showed Gort at one point in a, in a scene where they had to uh, play around him. Gort couldn't possibly pick up Patricia Neal, pick her up physically. Right. So they never show him doing that. They show him, she running behind a, a, a kind of a wall or something on the mall, on the ellipse, and he walks behind her and he disappears. And the next shot, which is in the, the preview, shows Gort carrying her. O'Neill had, had to be put in his arms so he could carry her out. Wow. Lord, good old Locke. I don't know what happened to Locke. <laughs> Maybe he went back to Grauman's <laughs> to do his <laughs> I assume he did. job, Dorman he, job. He had his moment in the sun. Oh, another thing about Gort, to make him work, the suit he had was extremely heavy, and he was enormously sweaty, and, and he was frail. He, didn't, he wasn't physically strong. And so he couldn't be in it longer than a half an hour. They could only shoot for a half an hour, and they had to get, have a break. So one of the things they did to make it easier to get into the suit which was essentially foam rubber, by the way, painted silver, was to have two Gort suits, each with a, uh, a zipper in the front and in the back, so they could get him in and out for different shots from oh. behind and front. Wow. Someone is asking a question that I don't know the answer to. You might, might, because you've lived here longer than I have. Um, when were the ball fields taken out of the ellipse? Wow. Uh, I, I never, I came here in 1964 to live and they were not there. So between that time. Oh, interesting. So that, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that ball, was... There were ball fields elsewhere. In fact, I played on some, but they were down on the, um, the long uh, polo ground fields. It used, it used to be called the polo grounds. Right, right. On the side of the uh, Lincoln Memorial. Right, yeah, yeah. That's and also... Played, that's where I played softball. Yeah. But they weren't on the, the ellipse. It, it was deemed too messy for the ellipse. It had to be prettier. Yeah. Someone else is also letting us know that Patricia Neal was in a film called Harm's Way, or In Harm's yeah, Way. In Harm's Way, yes, yeah. uh, with uh, John Wayne, which was uh, well received and a, a good one. She, in fact, she won the British equivalent of the Academy Award for that film, 1965. What is it you think makes this, is this in your top 10 DC film list? Yes, it is. It's so what is, what is it that makes this an essential or even a quintessential Washington DC film? Well, one of the judgments I make, uh, to, I have two or three qualifications for that point, uh, at least for this book. One of the uh, uh, important things is that the movie is distinctive in some way, 
or telling, either comedically or dramatically or otherwise, distinctively somehow. And the other is, at least for my taste, writing this book, is how it shows or depicts Washington, either well or ill. In this case, quite effectively and quite, uh, as I said, documentary style. Um, some movies mess up Washington big time, uh, but this doesn't. And it did it in the 50s when Washington was not a typical location anyway. It hadn't happened very often. So it was historic in part in that respect. Can I mention what, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah, no. No, I had a theme I wanted, before we start, uh, stopped, a key thing that I, I learned new about a while ago and, and was recently uh, uh, re-aware. The movie, um, the premise of the producer um, and uh, Rise himself, the director, and the writer, Stone, uh, North, they based their story and wanted to base their story on the threat of nuclear annihilation and the Cold War. That's what they wanted to depict symbolically through this. And it was pretty obvious that's it's that kind of story mm -hmm. and very, very typical of its period. However, after it was released or early on, even some critics and other uh, writers later kept seeing uh, uh, Rennie and uh, Klaatu as a, as a Christ figure. Yes, I've read that too. Coming to save the world. It's been yep. used many times since. It's yep. an obvious thing. Both yep. of the way he looks, the way he talks, mm -hmm. his, uh, his seriousness and earnestness. Uh, he's he's, he's res resurrected in the film. Right, I was going to say, yep. And his name, the name that he takes in the, the character, John Carpenter, JC could be Jesus Christ. Yes. Christ in the New Testament is often described as being a carpenter. That was his profession before he became a messiah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All of well, those cute little tidbits, and there's a number of others that people have searched for. And this is the fun part. The three filmmakers, the, the, the formers of the film, never thought once that he was a Jesus Christ figure. There was yeah, no, I read that, yeah. No symbolic intent whatsoever. And in fact, I recently reheard the interview with Robert Wise about that. And he reiterated, no, we had no idea. This kind of stuff came up as a surprise. So but you know what's kind of neat is do. that that's not unusual for something set in Washington, D.C. Even in Washington, D.C. itself, you know, the mall, there's a whole overlay that people can make about numerology. Yes. Positioning of memorials in particular buildings in Washington, how that relates to uh, Masonic belief, yes. Masonic orders. Uh, the Da Vinci Code kind of helped to popularize that. Oh. Um, so, and, and actually, to be honest, kind of in the vein that you just mentioned with a, a more Christian theme, um, the newish Museum of the Bible, which is not far from the U.S. Capitol building, uh, they have a film that you can go see that is a sort of virtual tour of Washington where you go about and on buildings where there are inscriptions, you go to look up close at those inscriptions and it's sort of implying that these are all promoting a Christian image or a Christian message. Yeah. Well, just starting with the cross of the major monuments on the mall. Yeah, yeah right. From the, right. From the Capitol to the Lincoln Memorial. Right. Someone is asking, is Sam Jaffe, who plays the professor in the film, is his house uh, exterior shot probably, is that DC or is that Hollywood? Both, uh, both were shot in Hollywood. Okay. Uh, the coming to the door uh, and then him looking through the window and then going inside to his study where he's doing, done his calculations. That's all uh, Washington, uh, sorry, that's all uh, uh, LA, Culver City. Again, because none of the principals, including Sam Jaffe, ever stepped in to Washington at all. So that's all done uh, in uh, at LA. Someone is offering us a really fun Michael Rennie fact. He Please. played an alien in a two-part episode of Lost in Space called The Keeper. Wonderful. So he reprised his alien identity. <laughs> well, good call. I mean, that's one I haven't seen. <laughs> I certainly haven't seen as much TV as I have in movies. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, we didn't talk about, um, well, you mentioned sometimes films just don't get DC right at all. Is, and you also mentioned that in the 1950s, there aren't a lot of films that are shot in no. Washington. 
in DC. No. Is there a film you can think of from this decade or into maybe the um, 1960s that just doesn't get DC right at all? Oh, sure. Uh, especially ones that aren't shot here, I'll just use DC as a theme. A uh, simple example, because it's really silly, but it, the movie's silly, so it doesn't really matter. But one I can think of is, um, oh gosh, it's a, what's the, re, a Legally Blonde 2. Okay. Which, where she becomes a, an advisor to a, a congresswoman in DC and writes a law which to protect her dog. It's a mess, it's just silly. Uh, and it's shot everywhere but DC, believe me, maybe in Utah and other places, and, and as well as California. But the, the, the way the Capitol looks, the way the chambers are done, uh, the, the way things are discussed, it's a, it's a vague remake of Mr. Smith, uh, the, the little right. person triumphing. Now that's one dinger, that's from 2002. Um, there, there are others, and oh, another really stupid one, but let me think, um, nothing to do with DC. Oh gosh, never mind. There are several. My book lists several. Some agreed. Well, for Washingtonians, we'll just get this one. We'll just bring this one up in our second webinar, and maybe we can we can end on this one. Um, I think for Washingtonians who like movies about DC, the one that comes to mind that's not a bad film at all, but there is sort of a, a an egregious um, error in Washington depicting Washington. And that's No Way Out. That's my most egregious error in Washington films. And you know what I'm going to say. It is the most egregious, and yet it's the most enjoyable because it's so improbable that a character would be driving, having a car chase down the Whitehurst freeway, then right. leaps out of his car, leaps over a guardrail, and we in Washington know he's going to be plunging 20 feet, like right. maybe equivalent of two stories, unharmed. And then he makes a mad dash into a metro station that is labeled Georgetown, in Georgetown. Right. He runs and in Georgetown, actually. <laughs> there's no Georgetown subway station. But I think what's really enjoyable about that moment is that everyone can recognize what was used for the Georgetown subway station, which was an entrance to the old Georgetown Park shopping mall. Correct. When I saw that, I put this in the book also, my own experience. When my wife and I saw that movie uh, downtown uh, in uh, 1989, uh, and that chase ended up in the Georgetown subways post, the audience went nuts. It was full. It was, the movie just opened. It was a big crowd, and one guy threw his popcorn at the at the screen. He was so uh, uh, he was so charged. But the, the, yeah, 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 horrendous laughter. And then it got worse because he ended up on a subway, uh, which was Baltimore's. <laughs> I forgot about that. That's right. I know. That's why. It's, that's why it's the most egregious it's error so ever. Bad, though. It's so bad. It's good. I think. Well, I think it is in that sense. Yes. It's never <laughs> been gonna, better for some. Um, I'm going to share my screen one last time so folks can see. Um, next weekend or next weekend, next Wednesday, um, at noon, twelve thirty, we're going to be doing a. Uh, discussion about Jacqueline Kennedy and um, a sort of lesser known chapter in DC history, how she was influential in the preservation, the 19th century built environment preservation of Lafayette Park. Uh, but she may not have been the only person who was influential in that. But next Wednesday evening at seven, we're going to talk about a very fine, finely made Washington DC film, Advise and Consent. Um, just what would you tell anyone who's planning to look at this film between now and then, Mike, what would you tell them to be looking out for, be aware of? Well, I think it's, it's one of the best Washington films in terms of content uh, about the Senate and how it works. And while not all of it is correct or, or perfect, um, it's really very much a Senate movie, even more than, uh, old, uh, than uh, Mr. Smith, uh, it's because it's based on a, on a novel that focuses on a, on a senatorial drama, which is believable, roughly, a kind of thing that actually might happen. Uh, and that's worth checking out. It also has a, for me, a very starry cast mm -hmm. of, of senior Hollywood folks who know what they're doing, and uh, they're well-directed by Otto Preminger. It's worth 
a look and guess what? Uh, you get another look at that terrific uh, set that Frank Capra had made of the Senate itself. Exactly Senate chamber. right. It's reused. And those, and those of you who are into DC sites and kind of off the beaten path DC sites, look for, see if you can identify the apartment building that Walter Pigeon's character lives in. I'm not going to give you any other hints. Okay. Can I can I give you a um, can I ask it without without being uh, too egotistical about my uh, a book club? Oh no, let's do well, well. Let's close with that last screen in case folks are wanting to read more beyond our webinar series. Your book, Hollywood on the Potomac, it's available on Amazon. And then if you want to get it directly from Mike himself, he can sign it for you. There is his email address and there is his mailing address. Cost is the same. Okay. One you get from the author with a signature and the other you don't. And let me, can I quickly thank uh, Amy, uh, Christine and Brenda for uh, ordering a copy. Thank you all. I, I'd be, I'm delighted to send you one. Good. Well, thank you for spending this hour on this memorable movie. I realized how much I liked it. Thank you so much, Mike. And we will uh, see you again next Wednesday evening for advice and consent. Terrific. See you then. Thanks. All so right. Bye-bye. Good night.